Welcome back to Sevenfold. In this tutorial, we're going to be taking a look at how to break down your surface and understand it in different panel typologies, but specifically analyzing for curvature and grouping that off into different visualizations, whether it's through arrows or different colorations. So that's going to be the first of a two part series. In the next one, it'll be if you're receiving an existing surface and you already have panelization in place, and that coloration, uh, you've got dedicated color types. You can quickly ingest and deconstruct those points, group them off into branches, and make them ready for any sort of downstream documentation or further analysis that you might be running. So the first part is how to build that analysis, and the second part is how to break it down. So there's just kind of two different approaches. So let's go ahead and just take a quick peek on screen. And the result that we're looking at is, let's see here. So the first part is the deflection analysis. You'll have the ability to study through curvature. And we'll talk about this in here in a second. But the, the big thing I want to show is how to format your data so that you can use a gradient to visualize how much curvature you're having in each direction. So this is curvature in one direction, this is curvature in another direction. And I'm going to show you how to break that down here in this tutorial. And then in the next tutorial, we're going to be looking at how to actually organize those into um, various groups and break that down. So you can see that and then um, and then when we when we bake that out, we'll actually be able to colorize the dots, which are 3D text according to the group that it's in and organize each uh, each set of dots according to the panels that they're associated with. So that's going to be in the second tutorial. OK, so let's go ahead and start this up. So the only uh, plugin that you're going to need that I'm recommending is picking up paneling tools. So if you don't already have that, take a minute, pause the video, go over to Food for Rhino and pick up paneling tools, and we'll get going. OK, so the first thing I want to do is I've already got my surface here loaded and I've reparametrized it. OK, and let's just make a little space here. So the first thing I want to do is go to grid and do surface domain number. And I'm going to plug my surface in and then get a couple of sliders pulled up. So I'm going to go one less than 50, less than 100. And I'm going to plug that into the U. I'll drag a copy and plug it into the V. And that'll kind of give me my sampling surface. So we're going to create a grid that is what I'm using to analyze the surface below it. So even though these are going to be straight edged meshes, it's pretty much just how dense you want to create your analysis. OK, we won't be covering doing localized analysis like when you need to get do a, a portion or a subset of that. So we can do that in follow up videos. OK, so I've got the grid. And then what I want to do is go to panel 2D and cellulate. And plug the grid in. And what this is going to give me is wires, uh, cells and meshes. And so this is super important. Um, meshes are very lightweight compared to NURBS surfaces. So this is going to be a faster performance for making edits and increasing your density. OK, so then I'm going to go to the Mesh tab and get the center point by using Mesh Area and go ahead and pull that out. These, uh, these points here are actually the corner points on the four sides. So we need the center point to get just one point per cell. And I like the center point because it's a better average. So now you might be familiar with this already, but if I just type in CP for closest point, I'm going to get my surface closest point and then feed the surface in and the points in. So that's going to pull it um, to the surface. What it's going to give me is this UV coordinate system. And now if I go to the surface tab and analysis, this is kind of the key component. This is this principal curvature is the particular component I'm going to check out. There's a bunch of different components as well. 
uh, that you can explore. So I'm not necessarily saying this is this is sort of the same as structural analysis. You would I'm focusing on how you would structure your data and how you'd get that organized so that you can visualize it. But if you're starting to analyze this for structure and deflection, definitely consult your structural engineer for more information and more details on which data types they should be exploring. And uh, this can hopefully help inform you on problematic areas before you approach your engineer. Okay, disclosure complete. So let's go ahead and put down that, that surface curvature, principal curvature. Feed the same base surface into the S input and the U and V into the UV output. Okay, so now this is going ahead and reading a bunch of information. Uh, the curvature you can see here, maximum principal curvature C1 and C2. And then these are a couple of vectors you can see there if I just hover over that. And so basically, if I zoom in on one, it's pretty much just saying curvature going across the horizontal way and then across the vertical direction. And uh, that's that's the analysis going on. So we've got that. What I what I like to do, so the first thing I want to do is I'm just going to put a plane down just so I have a container for this. Uh, if you ever see F for frame, that's the same as a plane. It's a relative coordinate system. And if you're not seeing it, um, mine are a bit small here. So I'm just going to update how big that is. Yeah, so pretty much what we want to do is build two visualizations for each of these numbers here. So what I want to do, if we take a look at what's going on here, I've got a bunch of floating numbers, which is that decimal point. And you can see there's a bunch of decimals here. What I want to do is connect that over to a gradient map. And just to save a bit of time on editing that gradient, I'm just going to copy, I'm going to copy the one from the script over here that I already have. But I've basically just defined um, this green to yellow to orange to red and put that as the uh, the gradient color. So I'm just gonna copy that over real quick because that's gonna be our coloration. The next thing I wanna do is analyze the range of values to expect from all these. So to do that, let's go to the sets tab or the math tab and inside domain, I can go down here to bounds. And when I flatten that list, if I just right click and flatten that, it's going to get rid of all these branches and just make one big long list for all the values involved. Okay. And then it's going to test all those values and pull out the lowest one and the biggest one. And you can see the lowest one is negative 0.043391. That doesn't really matter other than the fact that that's the lowest value, that's the highest value. Okay, cool. So now what I want to do, because this input gradient is asking for zero of the low bounds and one at the upper bounds, I want to remap, remap my numbers here. So to do that, let's go to domain, remap numbers. My source domain is this right here. The values are my curvature back here. And my target, if you hover on that, it's 0 to 1 by default. But <clears throat> for good measure, I like to be explicit. So I'll go ahead and construct a domain. And I will go ahead and do a panel with the quotes and 0. And feed that into A. And then I'll drag a copy and add a 1. And that just in my opinion, makes it a little bit more legible if you were to come back um, after the fact and read this script. Okay, so don't have to do that if you are comfortable with the default values, but uh, that's my recommendation. Okay, to define the number of typologies or the number of uh, unique values, rather than feeding these values directly into T here, I wanna go ahead and divide uh, this up into ranges. This is a little bit redundant, but I'm going to first ensure that whatever domain I have set here is going to be applied to this gradient. So I'm going to deconstruct that domain. Again, that's because if I change these values, but uh, the start point is the 
L sub zero and the end domain is L sub one. Okay, that's confirming that range. And then we just have to worry about the T value here at the end. Okay, so again, we're not feeding this directly in this time. Instead, we're gonna go to the sets tab, sequence and range. And this is where we're gonna define how many uh, divisions we want. So again, I'll just feed that domain in. And I would, I'm gonna make a number. And this time I'm just gonna make a, an explicit number of 20. And what that does is it gives me values from zero to one at 5% increments. So 20 divisions gives me every 5%. So that's kind of a nice number in my opinion. All right, so that is how I'm gonna split up my gradient. And then what I wanna do is I also want to test to see if the value is inside a domain. Let's just talk through this for a second. So, so I've got my divisions, let's go ahead and label that. I'm gonna right click and say, number of divisions and I want to go to domain and divide domain right here and we're going to take our input domain feed that into i and then take the count right here this is the number of divisions and I want to feed the same number of divisions in okay when I check that out that is giving me 20 values, 20 uh, domains, splitting from zero to 0.5 every 5%. However, I'm actually getting 21 values because of this index zero. So I've got, I've got one extra value than I have ranges. So what I wanna actually do is I wanna take my values here and I wanna shift them up I want to shift them up kind of halfway between 0 and 0 0.05 between each of these so that they're landing in the middle of my ranges. Okay. So to do that, we're actually going to go here, hover on the steps, right click and go to expression and say x minus 1. So I'm. Okay. So now I have exactly. 19 sort of I have 20 values in both I'm rethinking this as I'm talking about it a better way to do this might actually be to shift the list up halfway between rather than trying to split it equal divisions so let's try that real quick so if I just go plus and let's say Let's say because these are all equal divisions, I just, I'm just i gonna take the first two items and grab this and get, by default, it's the zero index, so that's grabbing that zero value. And then if I zoom in and hit plus, that's getting the plus one value. And I can just say, okay, go ahead and add those together. Oh, no, no, uh, let's do minus. So I want to get the difference from the first value to the second value. Divide that by two. So I'm just hitting division with the backslash. And doing a quotes right here. And two. So take this value, divide it in half by two, which should give me 0 0.25, 0 0.025. And then that is what I'm going to add to each of these. So I'm going to add this. Uh, 0 0.025 and that's going to go ahead and shift that up and then I'm going to clip the last the last number off this list okay so for that I'm going to do remove remove item at index not coming up so let's go to the sets tab go to sequence call index and there's a couple ways to do this, but um, I like to use a pufferfish component. That's just last index. So if you just find that component, otherwise you could do some reverse listing, but uh, this is a little easier in my opinion. 
So you can feed that in. That's gonna give me the last index. So if this list gets bigger, um, that's always gonna get the last item. And I'm gonna remove that item from this list. And now I've got my 19 values all shifted up 0.025 to land in the middle of my, uh, my domains here on purpose. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too complicated. So now we can take all these values and we're gonna run those into our T input. And that's gonna go ahead and dice it up at that percentage along this entire gradient. And the result is gonna be our colors. Okay, cool. That's our list of colors. And now we just have to go ahead and figure out which color from this list we're picking from for each of our panels. Okay, we've got one part set up. Let's go ahead and set the other part up. To do that, I wanna go back to my math tab and domain and go to includes and the values I'm searching for, here's the V input, are my remapped values. So if you remember, we took the min max, we remapped it to zero to one, and then I'm gonna take those newly formed values and feed that in. And I need to test that against all my divided domains, which we can see here. So take that S output and feed it into the D, so that's your domain. And now we're gonna use one of my favorite components, which is member index. And uh, some people might be tempted to actually go into sets and go to sequence and say call index or call pattern or dispatch, things like that. Um, I prefer this in many ways and I'll show you, I'll show you why. So the member we're looking for is a Boolean true. So let's go pull up a Boolean toggle and if you turn that to true and feed that into the member we're searching for, and then if you feed the, the results, I can always check this with a panel, but that's my true falses right there in the eye. Okay. So feed that into the set. This is the set we're searching against. And now it's gonna tell me which indexes are true, okay? And for each of these branches, I should expect to only have one of these be true because that means it's only one value is landing in that range. So now it's saying find the domain here that that value is landing inside of. So in this case on <clears throat> 378, index number 12 means it's landing inside of 0.6 to 0.65, okay? and that's that deflection amount. Okay, so then as you repeat that, it's gonna go panel by panel and pick different indexes from this list of domains that it's falling inside of. That's a critical concept to understand because this would be a nightmare to sort for if you didn't do it with this method. Okay, so now, what we do is we pull up an item, list item, so just typing an item. And I wanna say, take these indexes right here as the I input and pull out the colors, which is my gradient, okay? So we've got our colors and I typically like to overwrite this because I use list item so much. So I'll just, I'll just say colors picked, just so I remember. Okay, and um, this is fine. Okay, so now to preview that, we can type in preview and just pull up a custom preview. The M is my colors, so I'm just gonna feed that in, and the G is my geometry. Now, before we run that in, I can just double check to see if my branches are lining up. So let's check this out. Okay. So that's the same, and then if I go to back to my geometry, which is my meshes way back here, take those meshes, and we can see that we actually have one, one extra uh, graft here. So I'm just gonna 
just for simplicity, let's just go ahead and relay that by double clicking. And then let's simplify. I'm gonna right click and simplify. And then I, I can also just simplify with a simplify component if you want. And now those should be lined up and I can feed that into my G geometry. Okay, cool. So now let's go ahead and hide a few things here. So this is the exciting part. So now you can see we're getting, we're getting a heat map and this is telling us how, based on this, how much curvature we're getting. So in these red areas, we know we're getting a lot more curvature that could potentially be problematic for our structural engineers. Okay, so this helps us focus our attention on the panels that need more attention. And if you wanted to, you could switch this from this curvature, hold control shift and just unplug it to the other curvature. And now it's gonna analyze it in the opposite direction. So one was again analyzing it in this direction, one is analyzing it in the other direction. Cool. So I'm not gonna go through repeating this, but basically uh, you can copy the same method um, if you were to just simply alt drag a copy of these components here and this component here, so all of these, and just alt drag a copy, then you can feed in the other, the other curvature and just swap that out. And you could also look for true in both cases, that's fine. So what this is doing is it's looking for true in two different analysis conditions, but we're still picking from the same color scheme. So it's the same method, we just pick from two different um, analysis criteria. So uh, pretty simple once you got the basics set up. Now, if you wanna go ahead and bake that out, it's pretty simple at this point. Again, if you just have Elefront, go ahead and go to the E, bake, get your attributes over here, and then feed that in. And then um, I'm gonna put this on a dedicated layer, just call it analysis. And then colors is what you'd wanna feed in for each of the panels. So uh, it's pretty straightforward at this point. But yeah, you could just take the colors picked, feed that into colors, take the geometry and feed that into geometry. And again, this is just because we've taken time to align our data to have the same branch structure. And when you're good to go, just activate that. Okay. And now you've got your mesh analysis. So this is just a stepping stone um, to understand how to group your data with the member index component. In the next one, we're actually gonna look at if you receive this information, how do you start to break it down and attach some annotations and text to each of these panels to understand what the actual values are. Um, a couple more considerations real quick. Let me just pull Grasshopper back up. Um, it's important to note this, this is a really critical step. So when you're remapping your values, I did this from zero to one just to create some contrast. But if your panels are actually performing as intended, then you'd want to make sure you're setting um, this min max. Like, this is basically stretching those values. Um, so rather than doing a min max from all the values involved, you would take a dedicated source domain and stretch that to your target domain. So this is basically making a relative result every time you run this. 
So you're always going to get a red result somewhere in your, um, in your results, if that makes sense. Um, so if you want to basically say, get everything into the yellow or the green, then you would need to kind of work with this source uh, domain to make sure that you're actually hitting, hitting the curvature criteria or requirements of your project. Okay, and again, just talk to your structural engineer, get them involved sooner than later if you're gonna be doing complex forms, that's always a good idea. But this is a quick way to help understand what's going on with your curvature and the curvature of your surfaces. All right, hey my friend, did you learn something new? Let me know how you're gonna be analyzing your surfaces in the comments below. Definitely post some screenshots, I'd love to hear from you, love to see what you're working on. And let me know what uh, types of projects or analysis, optimization, just anything related to architecture and design technology. I know this is a lot of Grasshopper and Rhino lately, but I'm looking to cover a whole range of subjects on design technology and architecture. So let me know what you'd like to learn next. And if you haven't already, go head over to the BIM Academy. Uh, it's linked in the description below. Uh, you can track your progress for learning and consider some of the course content that we're uh, formatting. It's a great way to keep track of your learning pro process and um, get even more in-depth, tailor-made, outcome-driven learning for architecture. So hopefully you enjoyed this one. Appreciate your time, attention, enthusiasm, and curiosity. And until next time, my friend, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.